I'm pleased to be joined by KJ No, a journalist, researcher, and peace activist who has uh, really covered stories from around the world, but especially in East Asia, and uh, is here with us to break down um, the recent elections in Taiwan and talk about what uh, those elections mean for China-U.S. relations, for peace in the Pacific and really the, you know, the future of uh, of so many people. And so um, thanks, KJ, for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, um, I want to first start ask by, uh, sorry, I want to first start by asking, you know, the elections uh, came through with William Lai uh, winning 40% roughly of the vote. Um, you know, a combined 60% voted for uh, different candidates in the election. So break down, what does it mean? I understand the nationalist KMT still control the legislative UN, but um, which is like the parliament um, or legislature of, um, in Taiwan. But what does it mean that there was this disconnect between what the majority really wanted and what the outcomes were? Well, I think it's a very telling uh, result because uh, remember, there is the DPP, which is the incumbent party. This is the U.S. aligned, U.S. supported uh, party. So in a sense, it's not surprise. It's, it's not a surprise that the U.S. Uh, candidate uh, from the U.S. supported party wins in a U.S. influenced election in a US neo colony. I mean, it's it's that simple. But even so, uh, in the previous election, the DPP had won 57% of the vote. This time round, they won 40% of the votes cast, which is to say that two thirds of the people did not vote for them. And if we look at the actual numbers of uh, if we compare that to the actual number of the electorate, it's only 28% of the electorate that voted for them. And therefore, uh, we have to understand this as really a rejection of their platform than an acceptance of their platform of uh, secession. Now, people will tell you, well, you know, uh, Taiwan is a model democracy and this shows that you know, people chose democracy, nothing of the sort. The first thing to understand is that this is a first past the post election, which is a very, very unusual system for most political uh, electoral systems. Uh, there are only about 20 countries that use this system to uh, elect their executive or their head of state. Uh, and almost all of them are characterized by the United States as dictatorships or authoritarian or at best hybrid, but they're all incredibly uh, you know, maligned uh, countries from the standpoint of the United States. So Taiwan fits into this category. Essentially, they won the presidency with 28% of the vote. There was no runoff. Most countries would have a run runoff or a rank choice, or if it's a parliamentary system, there would be a cohabitation nothing of the sort. And so they don't have a mandate, but the US uh, press is claiming it as some kind of mandate. And of course, as you point out, uh, the DPP also lost the uh, legislative yuan, the legislative chambers. And so uh, right now uh, they've been outmatched by the opposition KMT. Uh, and then there is the TPP, which is a third party, which is uh, which will uh, determine a lot of the legislative votes, depending on how they decide to go. Yeah, that, that's really, I think, astute uh, reading. And I, I actually want to kind of dig a little deeper about the underlying issues. You know, this was billed both by Western media um, and by Chinese media as kind of an election um, about war and peace, and also to an extent um, about, you know, people's livelihoods, um, you know, uh, especially when it comes to uh, a lot of the rural working class in Taiwan, a lot of the fisher folk, um, 
and people who were concerned with rising cost of rent, you know, the housing crisis is a global crisis. But, um, you know, can you uh, speak to what, you know, based on your understanding, most uh, folks in Taiwan were really voting for if it was really a war peace election. And also, you know, I just want to say the one China policy, which is kind of a condition for having relations with um, the People's Republic of China, uh, you know, holds countries to affirm that there is only one China on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. So with that in mind, you know, how is this election about war and peace? So um, in order to understand that, you have to understand a little bit of the role uh, that Taiwan serves uh, in the geopolitical arena. <clears throat> Just a, a brief historical note, uh, for millennia, uh, Neolithic farmers would be traveling to Taiwan Island from China, from the Yangtze River Basin. They settled, some of them moved uh, a further Pacific, but essentially it was settled by waves and waves of uh, Neolithic farmers from the Chinese continent. Uh, in the uh, 17th century, it was briefly colonized by the Dutch, and then it was taken back by a Ming Dynasty loyalist, and then it became administered as a province uh, of uh, uh, of the Qing dynasty. And so it became an administrative region of the Qing dynasty. Uh, in 1895, China and Japan went to war. This is the Sino-Japanese war. And as a result of that, uh, the Japanese took or stole Taiwan Island and the Liaodong Peninsula as war booty. Essentially, they were on a colonial rampage. The Sino-Japanese War was fought uh, because the Japanese wanted to colonize Korea. The Chinese were trying to prevent that. The Chinese lost because the Qing Dynasty was weakened. And as a result, the Japanese colonized Korea, but also they claimed or they took as war booty the Liaodong Peninsula just to the north uh, east, uh, northwest of the Korean Peninsula, and then they also uh, claimed uh, Taiwan Island. So they essentially created uh, the colony of Korea and then two colonial outposts on of China. When Japan lost World War II, the Cairo Declaration uh, stated that Japan had to return all of its colonies to its you know former. Uh, uh, to their former, you know, uh, uh, leaders or former countries. Uh, the Liaodong Peninsula was returned to China quite rapidly, but uh, the U.S. Uh, became involved in a civil war between the KMT and the uh, CPC, the Communist Party. The KMT retreated to Taiwan, and then the U.S., uh, in the Seventh Fleet uh, became involved and essentially backstopped or supported the KMT to occupy Taiwan Island. It's a little bit like if there were a civil war during the U.S. Civil War. Uh, you know, the Confederate uh, Army retreated to Galveston, Texas, and they camped out there. And it's as if China had, uh, you know, intervened on the part of the Confederacy. Uh, on Galveston Island and prevented, you know, the Union Army from uh, taking back all of Texas. It's a little bit like that. And from Taiwan Island, the KMT, the losing fascist uh, party, claimed all of China for itself. Uh, in 1971, the United Nations passed uh, Resolution 2758, which essentially said there is only one China. The legitimate government of China is the PRC. And this was agreed to by the vast majority of uh, the countries of the United Nations. Essentially, the world voted the PRC is the legitimate government of China. And 
Taiwan is part of China. Taiwan is simply a province of China. Oh, and then in 1979, the United States normalized relationships with, uh, with the PRC. And so essentially, Taiwan went from being a Japanese colony to, for about three decades, a U.S. outpost, a U.S. military outpost, from where the United States threatened China. They had a military base on Taiwan Island. Uh, they placed uh, Matador missiles. They placed nuclear missiles uh, pointed at China on Taiwan Island. And then from 1979 onwards, after normalizing relations with China, uh, Taiwan Island went from being a U.S. base, a U.S. neocolony, to becoming a U.S. hedge. So for the next few decades, the United States had relations with China. It was engaging with China. But it always continued to use Taiwan Island as a hedge. And it also used it as a base for continued subversion against uh, global liberation movements. So Taiwan, although it didn't have official relations with the U.S. after 1979, it was a kind of subcontractor for U.S. dirty wars, U.S. subterfuge, U.S. subversion. So the things that were so dirty and so illegal that the United States could not have the CIA do it outright, they subcontracted to Taiwan Island through what was called the World Anti-Communist League. And on Taiwan, they had this uh, training school, a little bit like the School of the Americas, but on steroids, uh, called the Pay to political warfares, uh, uh, warfare cadres academy. And there they taught death squads and death squad leaders how to engage in, you know, uh, anti-communist uh, counterinsurgency, essentially how to brutalize uh, the people. And this happened all over the global South, which is why after 1979, if you look at the countries that Taiwan had continued to have relations with, most of them were Latin American dictatorships. Mm -hmm. They were deeply, I, I, yes. Sorry, yeah, I, I wanna actually ask about um, how that fits into the current situation as well, because, you know, William Lai, mm -hmm. who um, won the election, he uh, is an interesting figure because, you know, he has ties to the National Endowment to Democracy and, you know, um, in July 17th, uh, 2023, it was announced that Lai would be Taiwan's emissary to uh, Santiago Pena's inauguration in Paraguay. Um, you know, Paraguay, of course, is a country where the uh, indigenous uh, folks are fighting a lot of battles, just basic rights over water um, and facing a lot of repression. Paraguay is also very interlinked um, with uh, Israel. So, um Talk about that kind of uh, current contemporary uh, trend of, you know, um, where leaders from Taiwan and Israel and South America stand. Yeah. So, you know, once again, uh, Taiwan Island, after it broke official relations, it continued as a hedge uh, for U.S. Uh, uh, subversion uh, around the world. And it was a kind of a subcontractor to U.S. Uh, uh, geopolitical design, in particular in uh, dirty wars, anti-communist dirty wars. And so it has this continued relationship through the World Anti-Communist League. It created kind of a global clearinghouse for fascists around the world. So we're talking about Eastern European Nazis, Ukrainian Nazis, Croatian Nazis, all the Eastern European Nazis, along with the South Korean dictatorships, the Latin American dictatorships, uh, and the Taiwanese KMT itself was a military dictatorship, you know, until, um, until the 80s. It, it still had martial law. Uh, all of these came together and as I said, they were creating relations with Latin American dictatorships. They were one of the firmest uh, supporters of apartheid South Africa. So if you look at the medals that Taiwan has given out, its most important civilian medal, 
uh, that it has given out, uh, you know, historically, uh, the, um, the oh, you know, the Medal of Propitious Clouds. Uh, they gave this to uh, Kishi Nobusuki, Japanese war criminal. They gave this to P.W. Bota, the apartheid leader of South Africa. Uh, they gave it to Pak Cheng Yi, the military genocidal dictator, dictator of South Korea. Uh, they gave it to Jesse Helms. Again, you know, I think that speaks for itself. And then most recently, when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan Island, they gave it to Taiwan Island. So that is the company uh, with which she keeps. But once again, Taiwan was very, very important in maintaining Israel as a Zionist state. It was very, very important in upholding South African apartheid. And it was very, very instrumental in ensuring this kind of counterinsurgency, a subterfuge, dirty war all over Latin America. And the most, you know, the, the example that came to light in the media was when John K. Singlaub, who was working out of the Taiwan-based World Anti-Communist League, was running Iran-Contra. And so, you know, this was the weapons for, uh, you know, uh, for drugs uh, deal that they were using to f fund the uh, uh, Contras in El Salvador. Uh, and this was supported by uh, Oliver North inside the administration. But, uh, you know, the World Anti-Communist League was the way they did it under the table. And all of this is to say that, you know, Taiwan has this terrible, terrible history of, uh, of uh, collaborating with the worst uh, imperialists on this planet. And it functions its political class, certainly the DPP, has functioned as uh, butlers or uh, enablers of US uh, imperialism around the world uh, for US corporations, including in Paraguay, including in uh, Costa Rica, all over Latin America. And the NED connection is very, very important because the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, along with the National uh, Democratic Institute, these are proxies or cutouts for US uh, imperialist design. And most recently, uh, William Lai, you know, met with the head of the National Endowment for Democracy last year in July. Uh, he also, his uh, president, Lai is currently the VP, He's the president-elect, but he's currently the VP. The president, Tsai Ing-wen of the DPP, received the NED's highest award. So she won an award from the NED. Uh, and then, you know, the American Institute uh, of Taiwan, the AIT, which is the kind of de facto American embassy, it's it's just amazing. It's It's 10 acres large. I mean, it's Taiwan is a small country. And to think that you have, quote, an unofficial embassy, which is 10 acres uh, large uh, with a $250 million building is just mind boggling. But that gives you a sense of the American presence there. They already have uh, U.S. troops uh, on the ground training uh, and training other troops. They also have Taiwanese troops uh, in the United States training. And all of this is a kind of continued escalation and preparation for war, which has been mapped out in what is called TERRA, the Taiwan Enhanced Resilience, uh, Resiliency Act, which is uh, worked into the NDAA and is essentially law. It's a plan to micromanage Taiwan's military as well as to micromanage uh, its civilian government uh, and to ensure that Taiwan functions like Ukraine, uh, like a trigger for war against China, certainly uh, as a US outpost. The uh, terror legislation has specifically written into it uh, provisions for an enduring uh, rotational presence. Enduring rotational presence is just jargon for military base. Yeah, I mean, 
th these escalations we've seen in recent years um, are just rationing of tensions to a very dangerous place. I mean, really for decades, um, you know, the U.S. has been, uh, you know, interfering in Taiwan. Uh, you know, there's been armed interference and, you know, a lot of it goes back to the U.S.-Taiwan Business Council, um, which, you know, people like Paul Wolfowitz and Casper Weinberger, people who were um, defense secretaries for neoconservative administrations, were chairman of that council. And, you know, it it was th those figures who also uh, pressured leaders in Taiwan to chip away at the status quo. You know, a lot of people in Taiwan actually favor the status quo, which is they don't really want to shake up uh, relations with the Chinese mainland as they stand. You know, they do not seek um, Taiwan independence. Uh, and also the draft or military conscription is very unpopular in Taiwan. But, you know, there's this disconnect between what U.S. policy, sorry, what U.S. politicians and media say and, you know, the public opinion um, in Taiwan. So what, you know, is the context that Americans aren't getting about uh, what people in Taiwan are saying? Um, I think there are a whole bunch of things. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things is that, as you pointed out, the vast majority of people on Taiwan province want to maintain the status quo. The DPP has a secessionist agenda. And when you have a secessionist agenda, that is essentially a trigger for war. There's no country that I know of that will allow uh, secession, uh, a unilateral secession without it leading to some kind of serious conflict. It's true for even the United States. The, the bloodiest war that the United States fought uh, was a war against secession. And this is true for uh, China as well. Not only that, but Taiwan also serves as a geopolitical linchpin. It's the kind of keystone of an arch of encirclement around China, uh, starting uh, what we call the first island chain, starts in uh, the Kurils, goes down through the Japanese islands, Jeju Island, Korea, uh, and then Taiwan is the dead center, and then up to the Philippine uh, archipelago, and then the Indonesian archipelago. We call this the first island chain. The United States in 2011 declared the pivot to Asia, and then it essentially started to militarize this entire first island chain, filling it with missiles and bases and ships and preparing it for war. Taiwan Island is the closest point of this first island chain to China. It's 80 miles away. Uh, and it also guards the entry and exit points uh, along the coast or the literal coast of China, which is say there is the Miyako Strait uh, with Japan and then the Bashi Channel with uh, the Philippines. And these are the two entry and exit points along that coast. And the United States plan is to bottle China in along that coast and then to uh, start a war along the South China Sea, uh, perhaps in on Taiwan in the East China Sea, and then in Korea. There's, it's very, very uh, mapped out in detail. And this kind of choke point that they want to, uh, this kind of perfect noose, the Americans refer to it as a perfect noose. Uh, the breakout point uh, has to do with Taiwan. And so the US does not want uh, Taiwan to be reunified with China. They see it in their interest to constantly escalate against China using Taiwan as the uh, spear tip or the uh, center uh, of this encirclement. And so that's why there's so much contestation around Taiwan Island. The vast majority of people don't want to be pulled into a US war. They don't want to be turned into a second Ukraine. They don't want every last, you know, uh, male to be turned into cannon fodder 
for the United States. But the U.S. is in the process of doing this. And once again, if you look at the legislation of terror, there are all kinds of provisions to audit the army, to audit morale, to make sure that the Taiwanese uh, people are willing to fight, uh, you know, to make sure that, you know, there's enough uh, military force to uh, to wage war, uh, very, very similar to what we are seeing in Ukraine. And of course, as you point out, very recently, the DPP increased the draft from four months to one year. They increased the draft length uh, three times. And, you know, I assure you that the draft is not popular anywhere in the world, certainly not on Taiwan Island. Uh, and the fact that they increase the draft, uh, I think, shows how foundationally uh, they are at odds, you know, with the desires of the people. And then I think it points further to how illegitimate, uh, you know, this election is. Just a few more uh, points around, uh, you know, the U.S. influence. William Lai, of course, studied in the United States. That's why he goes by the name of William uh, he, as I said, you know, they did not win a majority of the vote. Uh, the majority voted against them. Uh, but his vice presidential candidate, the VP elect Louise Xiao, uh, was a U.S. citizen. Uh, and she was a U.S. citizen until she entered politics. And then it, you know, they needed to, you know, kind of erase that U.S. background. But she was raised by an American mother. Her mother is American. She was raised in the U.S. She went to school in New Jersey and New York. Uh, she was responsible for bringing Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. And she was instrumental in getting the Terror Act passed in Congress. Once again, this is the plan to Ukrainize Taiwan, to turn it into weaponized provocation against China. So she is one of the key drivers of this escalation, and she's doing essentially the plan that the United States has, which is to use Taiwan as a trigger for war against China. Now, uh, this trigger will not be pulled immediately because right now the US has its hands full in the Middle East and in the Ukraine, but certainly, certainly, Slowly but surely, this uh, escalation is happening. Uh, just recently, uh, Japan has made plans to buy 400 uh, medium-range missiles, I think Tomahawks from the United States. These are all nuclear-capable missiles. They are all subsonic missiles, which is to say that they're not rapid enough to be used as counter-strike. They are offensive weapons. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, very recently, uh, I think I think today, the British uh, Defense Secretary said that the UK has to prepare for war with Russia, China, uh, Iran, and North Korea. And you can see all of this is being built up. We're continually escalating to war. And the plan of war is when war happens, is to escalate it horizontally, all along the first island chain and all around China so that China is overwhelmed. It's There's some very, very nefarious uh, thinking going on. Andrew Krepinovich, who was the architect of the war against China, it's a battle doctrine called air-sea battle, which he started in 2009, 2010, 2011. Uh, he just recently wrote a new article in Foreign Affairs magazine, the Journal of the Council of Foreign Relations. And he essentially sent the message to the ruling class, we need to prepare for long, painful, protracted war against China. The article is called The Big One. And he said, prepare for war. This is what this is what we this is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is why it's really important for us to have these conversations and disarm the discourse, set the record straight, let people know that the war against China uh, is a, a war against humanity. It's unthinkable, and um, it's an it's an escalation that does not need to happen. And um, understanding the importance of how Taiwan fits into that, I feel, is so critical.
especially with all the fear mongering we hear from politicians and different voices in the mainstream media. So KJ, I really appreciate you bringing your perspective. Um, and it's such an honor to have you uh, be a member of our China as our enemy team. So once again, thank you so much. And uh, as always, I, you know, it's uh, so important to keep working for peace and disarm the discourse. Thank you, Kale. Uh, pleasure to be uh, with you.